Unique New York. Unique New York. What's up, Mike? I was just doing my warm-up vocals. <laughs> the sassy shepherd was scared by syphilis. The garden gnome had a normal-sized penis. How do you nice. warm up for a show, Mike? I just slap myself in the face a few times <laughs> and I have a drink. <laughs> Yo, it. welcome everybody to the Mike and Miss show. It's the Mission Accomplished podcast where combat sports meets combat vets. Mm -hmm. we got a big show for you guys lined up. Our first guest of the evening will be on very shortly. We just made contact with him. He's going to be on. He is the world champion. He is the BKFC lightweight champion, the Police Gazette lightweight diamond champion. He is Luis Baboon Palmino. He'll be on first. Our second guest of the evening will be a 20-year-old making his BKFC debut in New York, unique New York, March 12th at BKFC's fight night. His name is Lardy Cito Navarro, and he's going to be coming on pretty soon after Baboon. And then we will round out the show with UFC flyweight competitor, Always a fighter three away from a title shot. Miranda, fear the Maverick, will be here at 10 o'clock, too. So what's what's new in the world of SLC, Michael? You still look like you're in prison. Yes, I am in prison over here. I just, re I just read this long-ass friggin' thing about a war that nobody really cares about to hear about on this podcast. Took me like two hours. I was trying not to fall asleep. Yeah, well, you know what? The the bright it was light... interesting. What was it? Operation Anaconda? Is that what you're doing? Yes, yes. Operation Anaconda. Yeah, don't talk about that on here because it's not interesting to anybody but military people. So yeah, shut up, Mike. Oh, <laughs> uh, dude, there's so much stuff going on. Um, you know, we talked about it last night, but we also I, I talked about a few things with you right before the show tonight. Our Stu Not of the Week uh, nominees this week are fucking doozies. Right and you, you, you guys are going to love them. You're going to love them. Um, anyways, I got my wife texting me, right? I mean, she's texting me. And, and, and Mike, what's going on with your wife right now? I know. She's in the comments. I mean, don't they know that we're doing something right now? I mean, they can't even give us an hour or two? Jeez. Uh, Jesus. Oh, um, Lord. God. So, breaking news this afternoon, right around the 1 o'clock mark this afternoon, we uh, we lost our main event for BKFC uh, New York. Johnny Bedford has sustained a orbital fracture and had to pull out of his fight with Jared Grant. So short notice, um, Anthony Reddick will be stepping in in the place of Johnny Bedford and fighting Jared Kidgotti Grant for the interim BKFC uh, Bantamweight Championship. And then the winner of that will fight Johnny Bedford later on this year once he heals up that eye of his. Uh, that's a disappointment. I know a lot of people were excited about that. Everyone's always excited to see Johnny Bedford fight. He's an OG. He's a two-time champ. He's one of the originators in the BKFC. And Jared Kidd Gotti Grant is one of the hottest up and coming new fighters around at 4 0. Oh, he's a fucking beast. Everybody was looking forward to that. It's a disappointment, but you know what? It's a very good card up there in New York. So doesn't, don't make that turn you away from this card. You still got Dustin Page and Eddie Hoke. You got Jim Ehlers and uh, Connor Turney. You got Zach Kalmus and uh, Irishman McElroy. Teresa Sagala and um, Dan Zig's wife. I can't remember her first name. I'm fucking sorry about that. But there's a lot of good fights on it. Cito's on it. But anyways, we got our first guest of the evening in the green room right now. He is the reigning defending BKFC lightweight champion. Everybody knows him. He also holds that Police Gazette diamond belt. Mr. Baboon Luis Palomino. What's going on, sir? <laughs> Hey, it was good, guys. Hey, you, you sound really low, and I've done many interviews this way, but um, you for some reason, you sound extremely low. I can barely hear you, and I'm really close to the phone. Really? No, yeah, that's... I, I think something's wrong. Um... Can you hear me right now? I can barely hear you guys, and I have my volume all the way up. All right. Let's, uh, what do we want to do here? Mike. Mike is the tech guy, so do we want him to back out? 
Yeah, let's try that. You think you can just back out real can quick and back? come back into the link? All right, all right. Let's back all the way out of the link and come back in. All right, cool. All right, you know. Sometimes this have... happens with StreamYard, and I don't know why. Uh, I can hear you fine. You can yeah, hear I me. Yeah, I can hear you fine. And what I about people know. in the comments? Can you hear us? Because he sounded great. He sounded fantastic. Right. I, I'm hope I'm wondering if it's his phone. Uh yeah, put it earbuds in. Big Ben says, Oh my god, we got a mysterious fella in the comments right now tuning in. Mr. Patrol man's in the house. What's going on? Let's see if we bring him back in. Sir, how are you? A lot better. Uh, All right, good. All right, good. Yes, good. yes, yes. What is going on? The last time we saw you, you were defending your title in the main event at Knucklemania 2 down in Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> How have you been since the event? Uh, how, how's it going? I've been great, man. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I've been entering my fights like this and coming out the same way. I was pretty much <laughs> untouched. And even to add to that, like, my hands didn't even get puffed up at all. Like, I've been doing a lot of conditioning, and my hands didn't even puff up. Like, I'd have no – nothing. Everything was good. I could, I could literally fight next week. Unbelievable performance once again by you. Thank like, you. You, you, you – I mean, a lot of people keep trying to say that this is the guy that's going to do it. This is the guy that's going to do it. Like Martin Brown is the biggest, tallest, longest reach, strongest guy that you've ever fought. It was just business as usual in there. Were you surprised? Were you were you expecting more out of your opponent this time around with Martin Honest, Brown? Honestly speaking, yes. I was expecting more out of him. I mean, with all the talking and, and all that, I thought that he would come with some sort of more of an a hurry to become a champion and aggression, you know, a, a meaningful way of striking. But he was in a defense the entire time. It's, I was very hungry for a knockout, you know. I'm, I'm always very hungry for a knockout. But when you have people like like Martin Brown, Elvin Brito, very defensive type fighters, that, it doesn't mean, and I'm not saying that they're bad fighters. I'm just saying that their styles, you know, in, not Martin so much, but Brito for sure, the style neutralizes the other guy's style so much that it becomes a boring fight, you know? And and you can see that in the modern fight now with me too, where I'm trying to look for something, you know, but it's like, he's very, you know, just waiting with that style to roll the shoulder and, and counter with it. That he's waiting for that opportunity. I'm too fast. I have too, too much of foot movement, too much of good head movement, and I'm really fast for the weight class. For 155, I'm fast. I'm not a big 155. You know, I can do 145. You know, so I'm I'm really fast in this weight class, even at this age. And it's kind of like I see these people in slow motion. That's why I'm not getting touched. So, Mike, your thoughts? What I was, what I'm about to say is not to provide an excuse for Martin Brown because you may have already heard this, but you're the one who inflicted the damage. So, did you know that when you hit him in the first round, I don't know what exact shot it was. It might be the picture that you have on your Instagram that it messed up his equilibrium. He, he said after the fight, like after that, after that shot, it really messed him up for the rest of the fight. Yeah. He felt the power. He felt the danger that it was. If we get into trade into trading, he saw what could happen and, and everything stayed one, one, two, one, two, three max. That's what his strikes ones one twos one two three at the top at the max and there was two rounds there there was two rounds and he doesn't know this right but there was two rounds there where i was i always like striking a little more you know i look for fights and i and i and i excel very much on the where people go one two one two three i excel a lot of the four five six you know like if that makes any sense for you guys mm -hmm. right yep. so it's like when when they're starting to strike out they, they go one, two, one, two, three, and they stop. And normally I pick up on that timing. Yeah. So I'll go with that one, two, one, two, three, and I'll go four, five, six. And that's where I normally catch them, you know? But um, there was two times in the fight where I went four, five, six, six, seven, and, you know, he's waiting for the opportunity to knock me out. And he's a big dude. He got power too, yeah. you know? So he was just waiting, waiting, and he, he kind of caught me there. I'm not going to say that. He rocked me like where I saw stars or anything, but I felt the danger too. I felt the danger. You speaking of that, he felt in that first round. I, I felt it. That you was know, like, like, there was two rounds that I felt. I was trying to finish him, and and he he landed a good one, like top of the head, but it landed good. I'm like, oh, hold up, let's use our head a little more, you know, because I can't sacrifice 
my perfect record just because the guy is not looking for the fight either. You know what I mean? I, I still right. have to win, you know? Yeah, there was one. I want to say it was maybe like the fourth round. He, he caught you with a counter right like towards the end of the round that looked like it got you pretty good. And I was like, oh, shit, he finally fucking woke up. You know what I mean? Like we were all waiting for him to wake up and, and start engaging with you the whole fight. And it just was not happening. But like Mike said, he talked to us after the fight and he said that you hit him so hard in the first round in like he either said you hit him in the in the left eye with a right hook and it shook his like right eye. <laughs> and, and, and he goes and he's like man you know how martin talks he's all calm about it he's yeah. like man he's like i couldn't tell where the fuck he was the whole rest of the fight <laughs> he's like he might he's like my depth perception was fucking off he's like so i didn't know how far away he was the whole time and i'm That's like yeah, funny, man. <laughs> yeah yeah it was pretty funny he and like he even said that he's like i'm not making excuses he rocked the shit out of me and for the rest of the fight i didn't know he couldn't judge distance at all. Yeah, so, yeah, so he was in that, trouble. Um, yeah. So you, you had, you, you had your, your perfect performance. I don't know if you call it a perfect performance, but most people watching would couldn't really find anything you did wrong in there. You had uh you had um, an incident in uh, it, what we're going to talk about the incident afterwards, but let's talk about Logan Jenner real quick. You got your belts, you got from, but you took that opportunity to shout out somebody else before you took care of your own business. Can you talk a little bit about Logan Jenner for a second? Yeah. So, so Logan Jenner, right. You know, I, I try to do this and dedicate my last fight, my, my second to last fight, the, the fight with, uh, with, uh, this little guy, the Vietnamese dude. Right. Um, with that, that new yeah, yeah, that. and I tried, I tried to, after the fight, dedicate that fight, that win to Logan Jenner. And I had him in my banner. Right. Yeah. But there was like like a scuffle going on with with his fans and my fans. There was a lot of noise going on. People didn't really hear me right. And I wanted to still show this kid love because he inspired me in a time that was really bad for me, like really, you know, really bad. It was like one of the worst times that I've gone through, you know, because we're, we're talking about five years without catching a simple cold, you know, not even a cough, not a sinus. In five years without feeling anything. No headaches, no nothing, you know. So I've been watching for myself. I, I eat good, you know. I I'm really big into anti-aging, um, resting, recovery. Everything has to do with recovery, eating good. I'm really healthy. So when this thing hit me, I kind of like, you know, I I, I kind of like disrespected it a little bit, you know. Yeah. I'm like ah, like, like like nothing, you know. But in that time, you know, we already know the stories. You know, we, we said it plenty of times already. You know, it was really dark for me, really bad. And then this guy Manny. Who is the marketing director for Sativa, a clinic, anti aging clinic? He tells me the story about Logan Jenner, seven year old boy that fought uh, cancer and through a bone marrow transplant the first time it didn't work, like it didn't work out. And the second transplant, his body was fighting against the two, but the kid was not giving up, man. He was, he was there pushing. I hadn't met him yet until after the first fight, until after the dad fight. Mm -hmm. You know, he was too weak. You know, I wanted to bring him out, but he was two weeks still, still fighting against the, the organ. But finally, like his body, you know, like it took it in. Yeah, it took to and, the bone yeah, marrow and he, Man, I, I got to meet the kid just a couple of weeks before the fight. And I see this kid, he's there with his, you know, with his mom, his dad, his older brother. They got gloves on. We met at church. <laughs> they got gloves on, just partying outside. And this kid looks like he didn't went through anything. It's crazy. Because the first one, his body didn't accept it. Oh. And, you know, he went again and he got a second transplant and it worked, but his body was fighting it. So it was like, he was going through it bad. You know, yeah, in the meantime, for his life. he's going so through, and he's also going through chemo and everything yes, else at the same time, right? I, I can't even seven imagine. Years old, man. Seven, seven years, years old. old, you said, whew, I can't you even know, imagine. It, it, there was a time that I used to go and visit the kids in the Miami Children's Hospital that were fighting cancer. And I think that was a, one of the strongest time I had in motivation. Me, for people think people keep thinking that I did something for him. <laughs> he, I'm thanking him what he did for me. He inspired me in a really dark time, in a time that I didn't want to keep training. I didn't like. I mean, I wanted to, but I couldn't. Like, I would try to lift weights, and I crashed for two days. Like, my body was really messed up, you know. And uh, like, I, my, like we have everything written down. We have numbers for everything. My track work, my swimming, my sparring how high my heart rate can go, how low I can bring it, and how much time. 
none of my numbers were matching in that fight. Like my numbers from the fight before that were here with Tornado, and the yeah. numbers were that that fight were down here. This is the reason why I will never get this guy a rematch. You couldn't beat me or hurt me or scratch me in my worst of my worst. Yeah, at your lowest. You know what I mean? So the lowest of the lowest. Imagine helping me. Like, get out of here. It's not, I'm not interested in that. You know, but yeah, Logan Jenner was, you know, someone that just motivated me in the time that I mostly needed it. And I felt like I had to do something like, you know, to thank him, you know? And it was really my wife's uh, idea to to get a belt for him. That was her idea. Yeah, yeah that's you know, she was like, cool. man, he's like, a, it's like I kept calling him a champion. He's a damn champion. This kid's a champion of life. And she's like, yeah, we should give him a belt. And I was like, <laughs> man, that's a good idea. She went and researched Bob Bob. We got one made for him. This is you know Logan yeah. Jenner, cancer survivor, and he was so happy, man. Such a good kid, you know. It was so it was super cool afterwards after the event, seeing him outside the arena. People were going up to like him. And getting pictures with him, like, <laughs> it was real, yeah, it was really cool. It was like people, like you, kind of turned him into like a little overnight celebrity there. That <laughs> night. Cool. And like Mike That's Perry cool. came out, Mike Perry came out of the arena and like came right over to him, and he was like, "Hey, you're Logan!" Like fist bumped him and like gave him a hug and, like, <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. It was super cool. It was very cool. Yeah, I seen a, a post from his page with all the fighters. A bunch of friends. He had a good time. That's yeah, awesome. he'll never yeah. forget that forever. Yeah. He'll, he'll awesome. Never, ever, ever forget that for his whole life. So that was awesome. Yeah, shout out to <laughs> you for awesome. that. Now, now we got to keep going on the timeline here. After that amazing moment inside the ring, and you uh, shouting out Logan, you walked out of the ring and you ran into a guy that you just mentioned <laughs> in the ring. What was that all about? And are we going to get to see this fight? Is that what is next for? Luis Palomino is Elvin Brito at 165 pounds. What do we got here? Look, this is this was going on with this guy, right? He he literally does not want this fight. He does not want this fight. But I've been attacking him a little bit, you know, throwing a little spice in. I was focused on my fight. So I throw a little sum in there, and he finally felt like his back is against the wall and he needs to like bark back. Or else he's gonna look, he's gonna look soft, he's gonna look not interested. So he came and he walked straight to her, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to be respect. I'm respectful with everybody, man. I respect everybody until you respect me, you know. I'm walking straight to him and I'm trying to explain to him, like, what are you mad about? You know, the dude, the dude is mad because I called him my son. Look, I came, I came from a gym called MMA Masters, right? In MMA Masters is Sensei Daniel Valverde and Master Cesar. They're Brazilian. In the Brazilian world, right, the Brazilians, jiu-jitsu, mostly like jiu-jitsu and, and MMA, there's a thing where like if somebody beats you, that's your daddy. You beat somebody, that's your son. It's a joke, you know? Okay, uh, Josh Masvidal is my son. Big deal. <laughs> yeah. uh, Justin Gagey is my daddy. Big deal. Funny, you know? Hey, hey, real quick. Funny you say that because now Jorge Masvidal is fighting in the main event tonight. I mean, uh, tomorrow, two nights yes. from now, against a guy who trains at MMA Masters now. <laughs> Kobe Kobe. Yes. Oh, big, big circle of uh, <laughs> yeah. connection there. Funny how that works. Yeah, funny, <laughs> right? Really crazy. But um, yeah, man, this this dude. He comes in, you know, and he's trying to act hard because there's cameras around. And I'm trying to tell him, hey, hey, champ, you know, what I said in my post, I posted you in my Instagram, right? And I posted you saying, congratulations, champ. You have now earned your rematch. What's wrong with that? And he's like, you call me your son. <laughs> I'm like, yo, <laughs> like, come on, man, you know? So like, I'm, I'm like laughing at it. and trying to explain to him what I just explained to you. But then he's like, he starts saying some ridiculous shit. Like he starts saying, I brought you into BKFC. I brought him. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? What do you mean you brought me into? You were just my first fight in BKFC in a tournament. You didn't speak to nobody for me. Like, I don't know. It didn't make any sense what he was saying. He was trying to make it sound like if he helped bring me into BKFC. I'm like, what are we talking about? I don't even know this guy. You know, but whatever. Uh, you know, that right there at that point, I'm trying to be cool with you. You're being an idiot. So get out of my face. You know, I just pushed him off. He went flying backwards. And do I think that the fight's going to happen? It has to happen. It has to happen. Why? I ran through everybody at 155. Do you even hear of anybody calling me out of 155? Nobody's even calling me out of 155. There's one guy. Well, there, there is There's one guy. One guy and he does not reside. Yeah, yeah. There's one guy that does not reside in the 155-pound division. 
Okay. He said he would drop down to 155 and fight you, and that is Mike Richmond. I don't know if you saw that. Mike Richmond said – No, I haven't seen that. Mike we're, Richmond we're... – and, and this is a shout-out to you. He said the only guy he sees as any kind of competition in any of the weight classes from 155, 65, 75, and 85 is Luis Palomino. He goes, if I could cut down to 155, I would love to fight him because he's the one dude that I think that would give me a rough fight. Oh, that and awesome. I we we have that we have that interview. I think it's on our Instagram or ah, okay. Oh, so it was with you guys. Yeah, and yeah, it was YouTube. with us. Okay, yeah, I'm, gonna, with, I'm gonna look it up. He, look it up. He, he he also had a few things to say about Alvin Brito in that same interview. <laughs> he definitely used the word trash. And <laughs> he, he, went went he went off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he kind, I want to see that. Yeah, he kind of went off in that interview, but I will say that he was respect. He he was like respectful for you to okay. you. Well, look, that look, would I, like I, to I didn't fight even you. know about that. I didn't even yeah. know about that. And I was interviewed uh maybe like a week ago. I was interviewed and and somebody ah oh man, I don't remember who it was that that I don't know what interview it was, but because I've done so many right now yeah. since that fight, I've done so many. But I did one interview, right? Where somebody brought up um my pick for pound for pound fighters in BKFC today. And and because they were calling, you know, everybody's calling me the pound for pound, right? So I said, look, so he said, other than you, who will you put in a category, right? And I started thinking about it, and I'm, and I'm like, I told him Mike Richmond. I told him from the fight that I've seen Mike Richmond pull off, I says, I would say if it's not me, he's in that route, you know, because I've seen the way that he fought. He's thinking, he's aggressive, mm -hmm. you know, and he's a finisher. Powerful, yeah. He's powerful, you know, he got power, but he's thinking, See, a, a lot of these BKFC fighters, a lot of these bare knuckle fighters, they have this this belief in the head that this is a brawl. And whoever hits first and whoever lands hard first is going to win the fight. And it doesn't necessarily happen like that. You go like that and you go, you know, blindsided, trying to land wherever because you want to be the first one that lands with a hard punch. You end up landing somewhere hard and now you have one weapon less than the other. You know what I mean? So this is definitely a thinking game. You know, boxing is a thinking game. So there's a misconception where because it's bare knuckle and the brutality of it and the animality mm -hmm. of it, you know, that you're going to just come over here and bro, yo, you can do that. You can do that. But I don't know how far you're going to go with that route. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and Mike yeah. Perry boxing said is that. a thinking man's game. Bare knuckle is more thinking than that because you, the, there's no gloves. <laughs> you got to move your head. You got to move your feet. You got to be there, get hit, and not get hit, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Mike Perry, after his fight, he said that later in the fight that he didn't even want to throw any more shots because his hands were hurting so much, but he just kept doing it anyways because the instinct just kept saying throw punches. But he was like, I didn't want to because every time I landed flush, my hand was killing me. So it's things that people don't quite think of when they haven't fought bare knuckle before. It, there's a whole different science to it. You know? Oh, yes, the timing and the actual conditioning of the fist. How many people are really doing that? Not many. People are not really I, doing I think, that. I, I think do people are starting. I think they're really starting to now. Like it's starting to pick, yeah. yeah they're starting to pick five years into, now, into huh? the sport being around, five years into the sport being back around, like people are really yeah. starting to starting to people are starting figure, to find out, yeah. Figure it out, yeah. How do I get my hands under control in the third round, fourth round, fifth round? <laughs> yeah, I, that, I couldn't believe that's what Perry said. He was like, "Yeah, my face hurt, but my hands hurt way more than my face." Even did. more. Yes. I, didn't, I didn't really even want to throw punches. Um, yeah. We wanted to ask you about this. Um, a, say a fight against uh, a Brito is the fight to make, and you mentioned Peru, and you said you could sell out a soccer arena down there. We, you guys, have a new partner that has a boatload of money that could possibly make something like that happen. What are your thoughts on the Triller um, buyout? Not buyout, but the partnership between BKFC. I mean, and man, I think I think it's awesome. I think that's, that BKFC has been needing, you know, that partnership to take him to the next step. You know, Dave has done a lot on his own and the team that he has put together all these years. And we're talking about, you know, just not people with money. You know what I mean? So that what they've done and how far they've come without it, it's impressive. And now to have a partner like this that can back, you know, that can back your vision, that's really what it is. Dave and the team has a vision, you know, and it's very hard to execute that vision when you're chasing after money, you don't have enough funds, you know. Mm -hmm. Now with a partner that has that power, man, now we're gonna just we're Connected sailing. And as far as Peru, yes, I do 
Look, I have a, an entire country, an entire country. There is nobody, think about it like this, okay? Let's think about it marketing and business-wise, right? Business talk. There is not one Peruvian in the entire world with four world titles in MMA and two uh, active belts for bare knuckle, undefeated. You know what I mean? I'm the only one, all right? And my people are very proud people. They're more into soccer, yes, but MMA has been blowing up in Peru too. So it's only going to take a budget of marketing in Peru, which I already told Dave I'm available. I will go over there early. I'll be there for a month if I have to, okay? I'll do everything in my possession. In my part, I'll do it. To be in there and promote the fight, yes, I can fill up a soccer stadium. Yes, I can. My people are very proud and they love fights. We just got to market it right. We got to let them know, you know, you have a champion from your own country. And look, this is what we do, you know, present what BKFC is, you know? Now, does the Brito fight have to be in Peru? Look, I don't want to wait. I can fight right now. I can fight in April. I can fight in June, you know? Okay. Like, I, I can I can literally look, look, look at my hands. I'm, I was going to say, like, something like that probably na- needs some time to build. Yes, I to- think that the, the fight in Peru is going to need more time, okay? But let's not wait. Look, I'll give you right now a perfect, and you tell me if I'm wrong, a perfect main event and co-main event. Let's say Dave says... We're going back to Florida May, February, okay, any of those months. And very, very simple. I will be the first two way division world champion if you give me Brito. He's not beating me. I'm sorry. It's not, you know, overconfidence. It's, this is facts. He is not beating me. He touched me with one jab in our first fight in five rounds, just running the whole time, you know? And I've only gotten better. You know what I mean? In his last fight, he seemed a little more aggressive, you know, because he's fighting for a title now. He knew he had to push, but there was nothing new or better about him, you know. Yeah, if anything, I think the fight was very, very close. I think he won it, but it was very, very close, you know. Um, I would say Elvin Brito, Luis Palomino main event, co-main event, the juggernaut versus the Cuban samurai, team against team, the Cuban assassin, team <laughs> against team. I mean, look. You want to talk about sales? Nobody in, in sells Florida? more than me. In oh Miami, my God! In one. Miami, in Miami, nobody sells more than me. Crazy. I don't care who it is. Nobody sells more than me because I actually like selling tickets. I like sitting my people in good seats. I like putting my people in in one crowd. You know what I mean? So I I actually do it well. I do. I've been I've been a good seller since the beginning of my fighting career. You know, and the Cuban assassin. There's a thing called um, Vida y Patria, right? That he created a Cuban thing. He has the entire Cuban community behind him. Miami is like little Cuba. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yep. You give that man, I mean, look, you already know it. Dave knows this. Nobody at 195 or 185 wants to fight with the assassin. Not even at 205. Why do you think his last two fights have been at 225, 220? Right. Because they don't want to fight him. So if they don't want to fight him, give him the title. Give him the title shot. Let him take the title, right? And now, if you want to be a champion, that's who you have to fight. Now you don't have a problem. Man, you know they, I mean? they could. That. You guys could fill up a big arena with with the, those two, the co-main and main, and like yes, Big sir. Ben in the, in the comments just said, "Yuli, you put yeah. Yuli on that card. Oof. You put Yuli yeah. on that card. Like you put, you put, you put, you put the home guys, man, the home guys. That yeah, that would be an absolute banger. Put that in like May or June, and, and forget about it." Yeah, we, then, can, uh, we can take over the AAA arena easily. Absolutely. With a card. Oh, yeah. uh, w- let me ask you about this. Uh, Yuli was on that card. He, he, he showed uh, once again that he's got a level of toughness that people underestimate. He took a couple of shots, and then he knocked that dude out. But Chad Mendez, your thoughts on Chad Mendez on, on that evening there? He, uh, he, he, he impressed some. A lot of some people were like, oh, well, he was fighting fames. Well, what's your thoughts on it? Look, Chad is a, is a, is a sweetheart, man. He's a, he's a very respectful p- p- person. You know, I got to meet him for the first time over there at the press conference. Super cool dude. You know? Aside from that, you know, realistically speaking, and what I saw, I didn't see enough. That's why right now, and, and I don't want to say like putting, you know, fames down. I don't want to put fame, fames in front of mine. So I don't want to put them down. But we're talking about facts here. We're talking about re- realistically speaking, right? Mm-hmm. What, what has fame done in the fighting world right who has he fought how many fights has he had you know what well, he had like 
amateur fights, and I think he had a couple of pro fights in boxing. I think he had a, That's I think it. he had two, right? Like two pro fights. But then yeah. he and like honestly, he beat Paul Teague. Well, it's uh and then his fight in Bernal goes Paul T exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, so so what I'm saying is the, the caliber of fighters he's on his know? way up. He's on his way to try to get better competition and make his way yes, up yes. to the ranks. Yes, yes. So so I would say I would like to see Chad. Look, to be very honest, man, <laughs> I look at Chad like a money bag, you know. That's my money. Chad money. Money Mendes. Yeah, money money Mendes. You know, I'm gonna make more money fighting Chad than fighting El Brito. You know what I mean? But at this stage, you know, in my life, I'm more about my legacy. Yeah. You know, more about my legacy, sure. you know? I want to mm -hmm. be the first 165-pound world champion. Chad can wait. He can wait because I'm ready to fight, like, right now. If they book this fight right now, I'll, I'll fight Brito, like, right now, like, in two months, if anything, you know? So if they, if they put it together quick, I'll, I'll fight Brito, take that belt, defend it against Chad, come back up, and whoever's next, Mike Richmond wants to come down to 165. Uh, the winner of of Jim Adler's with the new guy that signed from UK, Connor Terry. Connor Terry, which is a good guy from from what I heard, he's mm -hmm. really good himself. Yep. You know, that's, that's actually a really good fight. You know, whatever you know, but I, I would I would like I would like it in that order because I defended my title four times. You know, you gave that new young a chance to fight for another title without even defending his belt. I defended my four time. Four. Four defenses, six and oh. Nobody has done it. If I ask for something, I believe that I've earned it. And that's the 165 pound title. After that, Chad is next. Okay, rich man, whoever's next. I don't care. But I would like that belt first and then continue moving forward. It's it's amazing all the options that you have mm -hmm. right now. It, it really is. Like when, I guess when you're the top dog, the options are plenty. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You got guys from two divisions higher than you that want to come down to fight you. You, <laughs> you got you got half the division above you that wants to fight you, including the champ. You you got Chad Mendes, and, and it's it's unbelievable where the sport is at right now. Um, before we we let you go and. We, we're glad we're thank you for giving us so much of your time tonight. Um, thank you guys for having me, man. You know, we talked about, you know, our show is, is where combat sports meets combat vets and your brother was in the military, but I don't even know how it slipped through the cracks. We didn't even realize that your son is in the army as well and graduated yeah. from basic training not so long ago. How is your, yep. how's your son doing in the army? And you must be, he's, he's doing great. I've, I've lost contact with him. I don't know if it has something to do with the training because He's going to be like launching missiles and stuff, you know, like he actually scored really high in the testing. Nice. So that's what he aimed for, you know, you know the tech, the techie side, you know, missile launching. Is, he, is, he, pa is he Patriot, Patriot missiles or? I have no idea to be very honest. I'm, to me, this is all new. My brother's the vet yeah. that knows all about it, you know, and, and I know that he did basic training and after basic training, he went into the real training for that. Yeah. So AIT, I don't yeah. know if they... He's not and, that, and that's where, he, or not, that so where I haven't he's, heard from him. he's currently there now still. Yes, he's now. He's there now doing the real the real training now. Man, yeah, I can't I, cool, like honestly, know? I wonder what it's like for your son because like I went to basic training after 9/11. So I knew that like I'm going to get out, I'm going to go to AIT and then I'm going to go to I'm going to go overseas. That's yeah. I know I knew that was going to happen. Now your son is there and all this shit with Russia and Ukraine is going on. It's kind right. of similar to like me 21 years ago. <laughs> I wonder what it's, I wonder what the atmosphere is. I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how it is when you finally talk to your, your son, like. Ask yeah, him I'm waiting, I'm waiting on the call, man. I don't know what's going on. He, he, you know, the last time that I spoke to him, he was extremely excited. He was very happy that he made a decision. That's great. Yeah. It's when a great you're at I mean, that point at the end of basic training, you you then you know like okay, the, the what you perceive to be the hard part, you've gotten through it. So you've already climbed <laughs> that ladder. You're in, you know, you're basically you're part of the military now. You just have to go to your advanced individual training and learn the job that you're looking forward to learning. Yep. Get in there, get dirty, you know, learn everything you can because this is now your future. So yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's super excited right now. Yeah, he is, he is. He definitely yeah. is right, and and if you talk to him, and and I have a friend of mine whose whose brother just left for basic training a couple of days ago, and she's like crying and all tore up because of her <laughs> little brothers. I said, listen, your little brother 
just joined the biggest gang in the fucking world. <laughs> right? He's going to, he just joined the biggest family in the world. You're going to, he he's going to hate life for about three, four weeks. And then he's going to, a switch is going to go off and it's going to be the best time of his fucking life. He's going to absolutely love it. And when basic training's over, he's going to say that he'll, he would do it all again. And <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, it, there's a weird thing. Cause like the beginning of basic training is fucking hell. It really is hell. And like you miss home, you miss your friends, you miss yeah. your family. The you food don't sucks. You don't sleep. You don't shower. It's just like you're getting your ass smoked every single day, all day. And then like four or five weeks into it, you're like, this ain't that fucking bad. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't that bad. Maybe that's I, when I, you like. I got to see some of it. You know that? Because I, I went I went to a, I forgot what it's called, Fort Pierce. The I went to a military base that I was invited through the um, RMA Junkie guys. Yeah. And I was over there with Dan Henderson uh, Rick Lamas, uh, a couple of other guys from UFC doing like a USO visit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we got to see everything, like everything, everything. And it was right when my son had left to basic training. So they were there like four in the morning. These kids are freezing, rolling around the wet sand. Like, Oh my God. Like, Oh, that's what he's going through right now. And, he, and that wasn't even, that was just Virginia. My son was in Oklahoma. Yeah. It was like really cold. Fort Sill. Yep, for sure, Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh yeah, Oklahoma, field man. artillery. Exactly you should be where proud, should be. man. You know what? Like I was a little shithead kid. Mike was a shithead kid, and and I don't. I'm I sure know. your son was not a shithead because he's got a goddamn champion as a father. But <laughs> um, when we went in, we were not what we are today. And I owe everything that I owe everything that I have in this world. My wife, my kids, my house, my everything. So. Yep. You be proud of your son. Awesome, I am. Where, wherever he goes with it, I mean, best of luck to him and thank awesome. him for serving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, man, you, you're always a great conversation. You're you're an intelligent, well spoken ass kicker of a fucking champion. So uh, we'll give you a second, say some final words, and let you get on your way. Also, you man, just just about that, you know, to all the supporters and everybody that's listening here, keep following me, please. I'm trying to grow this Instagram page at Luis Baboon. And other than that, man, stay tuned. I'm collecting another belt, collecting another head, and always here to serve, man. You know, thank you guys for having me once again, and thank you to all the sponsors. If you can see them, there's too many to mention, but thank you to all of them. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Thank you very much, Mike. You have anything else for the chip? Nah, thank you so much for coming on again. Thank it's you always a pleasure. Likewise, always man. Anytime. All right. Till the next time. We'll see you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Later. Class act, dude, for real. He really is. He's a yeah. class act. Everybody says it, and they all mean it. Um, his social medias were at the bottom there, but Louis Baboon is his Instagram. He just said it. Um, that's all he asked for. <laughs> give, him a, give him a follow on his Instagram. Yeah. So we can build Get on his that follow. Instagram. Because as crazy as it is, as dominant as champion as you are, and as whatever, it's all about your goddamn social media following these days. Right, Mike? That's right. That's what it's all about, man. You... We gotta. We need a damn handler over here. Yeah, he's a fucking awesome dude, and uh, love the glasses, Mish. Hey, Anthony, DJ Tony, Oro Orozco, Orozco. Are you Italian, Puerto Rican? I didn't know. I mean, <laughs> what is that? Um, I wear them to look smart. It's not because I can't see anything. I swear. Right, Mike. You're wicked smart. Get the hell out of here. I'm wicked smart. So, hey, our next guest, his name is is uh, Lardy Navarro, also known as Cito. He's going to be coming on in a few minutes. Cito. But in, in, in the meantime, I don't know where he's at. He should be ready to go right now. Hey, but in the meantime, Cito, Cito, where you at? Cito, where you at? He was watching the damn show. But anyways, <laughs> while he while we're waiting on him, guys, whoo, baby, I got some fucking nominees for everybody's favorite segment of the week student of the week hey mike <laughs> get that off my lawn you student oh god hey let, let, you know what let's bring in cedo he can help us do student of the week before we uh before we before we do this let's bring our friend mr lottie cedo navarro who will be making his debut march 12th Seneca Allegheny Casino, Salamanca, New York. 
the outskirts of New York, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think you can drive to the city and go see this guy's debut. No, 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 no. You got to drive like seven hours past that bitch. That's but the way up north. That's the way up there. So Too here he cold. is, Mr. Cito. What's up, dude? What's up, uh, guys? Yo, yo. The, the Smith Brothers product himself. We met this kid down in Miami. He is a fucking treat, and he loves chicken, and he loves to fight. What's going on? Not much, man. Just been training really hard, you know, every day. Training very, very hard. So, hey, would you like the honor? Would you like the honor? Before we talk about your upcoming fight and your debut and everything else, would you like to help us judge who is the dumbest motherfucker on the planet for this week alone in our segment called Stoon Out of the Week? Would you like to do that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Here we go. Stoon Out of the Week with special guest judge Cito <laughs> Navarro. You don't want to lose any fans in Florida. No, no, no. Cito, you won't lose any fans. We'll take the heat for all of this. this the nominees are at the bottom of the screen right there. I'll, uh -huh. I'll go through them, and then you guys will judge. First up, first and foremost, is the current welterweight okay. champion in the UFC, who, during an interview, said, I am the biggest money fight Canelo Alvarez will ever have. I will get him nine figures, and I will beat Can Canelo Alvarez. Kamara Usman truly believes that he actually has a shot to beat Canelo Alvarez, a guy who fucking made $5 million in one fight 10 years ago. This fucking dude's tripping balls. Never, ever will that be correct. Number two, Joy Behar, I think I say her name is. She is a host on The View. She talked about um, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the biggest fucking pain in her ass to do with this thing is that she had to cancel her vacation to Italy, which she had been planning on for four years. And goddamn Russia killing Ukrainian babies has ruined her vacation. Joy Behar. Next up, we got Sean Strickland, UFC middleweight. Sean Strickland says Ukraine should just bend the knee to Russia and let him have the fucking country and get over it. Right. And then when asked if he really believes that, he said, if Russia gives me $10 million, I'll fight the U.S. I'll, I'll fight the U.S. right now. That is Sean Strickland. Oh, what a real and, piece of shit. Yeah, what a real piece of shit. And then last but not least, another Strickland, no relation. His name is Matthew Stretch Strickland. And we talked about him last night on the show. And I decided, Which fuck it, we're going to just say. He says, Cain okay. Velasquez should be ashamed of himself for putting his son in daycare, right? He should have been a better father. If his, if his son wasn't in daycare, he wouldn't have been molested. And if he would have taught his child how to defend himself better, he wouldn't be getting molested by adults in the world. This guy truly believes this fucking shit. Um, those are our nominees, guys. You got Kamaru. Okay, go ahead. Okay, let's bring it up. Here we go. Mike. Break it down for us. Oh, Mike. my God. I don't think that it's even close right now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. I think I'm lagging. Am I lagging? No, you're better now. Go. Oh, so, listen, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad area right now, so... I don't think it's close at all. I think that it's going to be Stretch Strickland by a mile, by a stretch, shall I say. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you if you say a little kid is a fucking wuss if he gets raped by an adult? I mean, what is going through your mind when you make these comments? You cannot believe that. You can't be serious, can you? Come on. Who says that type of shit about kids? Unreal. <laughs> Cito, your thoughts. I don't know, man. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> so, that situation is it's really, like, crazy. And, like, I, I wouldn't expect that. when, Especially when I heard the news about it, it was really sad. And, um, It was just really sad to hear it, you know? For the, for the, of, Kane, the Kane situation? Yeah, yeah the Kane situation, yeah. I, I just keep thinking about that out of everyone you guys mentioned. Yeah, 
he um so yeah that uh stretch strickland went on social media yesterday he called kane's kid a wuss for not being able to defend their self against an adult molesting them he also said that kane is a uh you know sh- should have been a better father and kept him out of daycare so with that said i don't think there's any debate about it joy behar is a fucking moron Kamaro Usman is one of the greatest fighters on the planet, but he's delusional if he thinks he's going to beat uh, Canelo Alvarez in a fucking boxing not, match. Get not a the chance. F- <laughs> yeah, not a chance in hell. And no. Sean Strickland needs to just stop baiting people on social media and saying crazy shit because I think that's all he's doing now. Stretch Strickland, you're the fucking stoon out of the week. With that <laughs> said... We have a guest. We got Mr. Cito. How are you? You are fighting Anthony Prater, March 12th, Seneca Allegheny Casino. How excited are you? We met you down in Miami, and you were excited back then. Now you are so much closer to the fight. It is your time. How are you feeling, man? Yeah, man, I feel really happy. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, I feel very confident ahead of this fight. I feel very prepared physically and mentally prepared for this fight. Um, you know, all, I, all I'm going to say is I'm not going to underestimate my opponent. I know what I'm getting myself into uh, on March 12th, you know, and I just want to say I'm not going to go in there with my boxing background because, you know, I'm, I'm ready to fight, you know, um, I'm prepared for it, you know, but all I'm going to say is on March 12th, no more talking for me. I'm just going to let my hands do the talking. There you go, man. Hey, tell us a little bit about your back, background. You, I know you got into the BKFC through a tryout. Um, yeah. But, but where are you originally from, and where did your fighting background start? What age, what style, what, what was it? Yeah, so a uh, little bit about me. Um, so I was originally born in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, you know, I lived in a bad, bad, bad area. Uh, in the na- neighborhood, you know, the street gangs, the violence, the guns, the, dr- the drugs, you name it all. I was all that, uh, you know, but I consider myself raised in Worcester, Massachusetts, because, you know, that's where I grew up my whole life, my whole friends, neighborhood, school, everything. Um, you know, and I got into the fight game when I was really small, really little, you know, and I'm still a little kid to this day, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, what I was, <laughs> m- my younger years, I grew up more fighting in the streets. I was more, I was more hard headed. I, I just loved to fight. I was always fighting in school, you know, in the streets and the hood, you know, everything. And, um, after that, uh, I think I was at the age of 13 or 14. No, I'm sorry. At 14, I started martial arts training with, uh, he fought in BKFC eight. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He was the main event, Gabriel Gonzaga. Yeah. He yeah, was yeah. my, yeah, he was my first trainer for jujitsu. Um, oh, shit. that was the first guy I trained with. And um, after that, I did I picked up boxing, and um, I started my boxing career. I, I wanted to become an MMA fighter, but I was so hard headed again because I just wanted to fight. So I started boxing at the age of fourteen. When I was like about fifteen, that's when I had my first amateur boxing fight. Um, I was I was fighting a lot of uh, you know a couple of amateur boxing fights. Mm-hmm. I won a couple of Golden Gloves. Uh, I won a couple of championships back in New England. I fought a lot of regional uh, guys. Uh, I went to the Nationals. Um, in the Nationals, it was very hard. You know, that's because those were, that's the test. That's the big leagues, you know. Um, and that was more of my background. You know, I came from the street. I wanted to be smart. I said, you know what? I like fighting. I love fighting. I want to turn it into a career. And here I am to this day fighting for the biggest fighting organization in the world. And I'm very proud to say that. Mike, he's in New England. I know. How about that? And actually, the last time we saw you were in Florida, where the weather was beautiful, and we were eating Chinese food and drinking and having a great... Well, you weren't drinking, but we were drinking. Why would you be drinking? You're getting ready for a fight. You were good. Uh, you and the other guys were good. To You couldn't cheat a little bit. We tried to make you do it, but you wouldn't budge, man. You wouldn't budge. And now, you got to go up to damn Niagara Falls and freeze your ass off up there, but you better, you got to stay indoors. Uh, I'm not ready that you know i love the weather here in florida you know but um nah man it was a great time um down here in miami um you know and i want to i want to give a shout out to kevin smith uh, my manager he's been um he's the the main guy that helped me a lot um you know for this training camp fight camp and i'm really grateful that he's the man that made me introduce you know to you guys um he brought me out to knucklemania my first bkfc event you know, and I, I'm, I was just so happy to meet everybody, you know, and um, 
I just can't believe that I'm here. You know, it's it's really crazy. It's like a dream come true, man. You're, yeah. you're uh, this dream is your true. this is your pro debut, right? Like, is your pro anything? You you don't have yeah. any pro of anything. I didn't want to do boxing because um, you know, the boxing business, with all the respect, it's just like a uh, it's like a dirty game. You know what I mean? And like I know part of myself, I know I have the skill, the talent, the heart. So I wanted to bring that to an organization that I know that I'm, I'm worth for. You know what I mean? I'm meant for to do something, not just boxing. Because I, I don't want to be known for fighting 20, 30 bums and then fight up top guy. No. I want to be known, you know, fighting a bare knuckle, fighting a top guy, you know, and making my way up and then soon to, you know, become a world champion. I love, I love that you just said that because a lot of people will be like, oh, man, this guy is 23 and 1 in boxing. He's unbelievable. It's like, and I'm not taking a shot at like, like even Khabib Nurmagomedov, one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. He's 30 and 0 or 29 and 0. I think he retired at 29 and 0. If you yeah. really go look at his record prior to the UFC, he fought a bunch of no name fighters. And it's very similar to like a guy who's got like a 30 and 0 boxing record who fought 23 guys that had like 19 wins combined. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I don't want to be known for that, you know, and I realized at a young age, I was like, you know, what? like, I don't want to be known for that fighter. I, I want to be known back home, my people to know like, yo, this kid Lardy, like he fought like top elite fighters, you know what I mean? Um, and the real type of fighter I am, because when I was an amateur, I was fighting a lot of like uh, national uh, fighters and elite fighters. And I, I would always fight anybody. So it was like, that was my main thing, you know, and I would beat them all. I would beat some and they would, you know, I would lose some cause you know, it's all uh, experience, but um, especially at the trials, I was like, you know what, like at the trials, I want to show these guys like, you know, who I am. And, and then, and here I am a year later, you know, people will know. One year later and you're making your debut at 145 pounds, but we talked to you, right? You're 145. Is it uh, my fight at 145? Is it you fight at 145? Yeah. Five, yeah. But I, I believe you told us when we were down in Florida that you plan on moving down to 135, right? Because that's the more interesting that there there's more killers down there. You want to yeah. take this fight, after, win this fight, and move down, right? After this fight, after I win, um, I plan on moving go to 135. I think that's the smart uh weight class that I want to fight at, and um, there's a lot of big names on that. So, um, you know, I would like to test myself on that um, that weight class. But not only just that, I just I, I, I just consider myself a 135er. When you yeah. heard about the main event uh, on March 12th in that division, w what do you think about the new main event and, and what happened? Or do you know? Oh, about it. <laughs> and when I heard about it, I was like, damn. I was like, damn, like, what, what what, was really going on? And, you know, and I, like I said, I, I didn't want to say much because I'm new to the game, you know, a bare knuckle. So I'm not the talking shit type of guy, you know. I'm mm -hmm. not like that. All I want to say is, like, you know, uh, I hope Johnny Bedford uh, recovers, you know, um, heal. Uh, I'm very interested to see the main event now. Um, I think Raddick's, that, like, this big? Yeah. The, the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Anthony Reddick is, like, six Red foot three, and he fights oh. at 135. Yeah, you know, and um, Jared Grant's a beast, you know what I mean? And I think that's going to be a really, really good matchup. I think a lot of people who – a lot, I don't I don't think a lot of people are going to – are even giving Anthony Reddick a chance in this fight because of who uh, Kid Gotti Grant is. But when you look at it, if you step back and, like, you look at it from a stats and, and size thing, people might be like, oh, shit, that guy's six foot two, six foot three. Uh, Kid Gotti's going to have problems. Remember that Gotti trains with HD Davis every single day and he spars with Howard Davis and Howard Davis is a very big, strong 145 er So mm -hmm. if he's been steady sparring with HD, I don't think Anthony Reddick is all that much of a problem. My, I, yeah. My point exactly. And, uh, Howard Davis is like similar, like what to, uh, Anthony is same, what high, same, similar reach, same reach. Yeah. Right. I think and, very know, similar. Yeah, and Howard got some great boxing, so I I think Jerry Grant um is ready for this fight regardless, you know. Um, that 
but I'm I'm more I'm really tuned into the uh the main event, but I'm more tuned into my fight, you know, as well. So like you know, I, I I'm more focused on my fight, and then after I win, I get to relax and watch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as you should be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, and uh and the Seneca Allegheny Casino is a pretty nice place. I'm I'm sure you have never been there before because we, no, we never even heard of it before the first time we went to it. But I will say nice very nice venue uh real intimate setting they could stick like 13 1500 people in this what looks like a small area they mm -hmm. pack a shitload of people in there and they put it on a really good show and the in the casino itself is very nice they have good restaurants there it's a, it'll be a nice place for you guys to uh to do a little celebrating afterwards yeah man i can't wait i can't wait for that experience um you know i have my family my friends uh driving all the way from like seven eight eight hours just to come see my fight and it really makes me happy that they do that and even if not like i'm still happy for my supporters anyways because you know i I don't, I don't forget where i came from but at the same time man I'm, I'm really excited for this fight like i'm i feel very very prepared you know i've been i just been training really really hard you know talk, Kevin, talk about talk about that for a second talk about your yeah. training regimen because i know you're surrounded by guys with like kevin smith's got ryan o'reilly around you you got jay jackson you got some some tough big guys killers around you so tell us a little bit about your training heading into this fight and the training here is the training here is like well the respect like the way kevin trains me here is is so different compared back home because this type of training is is hardcore training, like a training that will get you tired and exhausted, but you push yourself to the limit and to the limit, you know, you, and you got to push yourself even harder. And I've never had that type of training before, which is making me more confident. You know, uh, Kevin sees so much potential in me that he has these far experienced guys. And I love that, you know, because that gains my conf confidence, you know, and like every day, like every day in the morning, I try, every day in the morning, I train, you know, I wake up every day. I train, you know, even I train overtime, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's just a thing, you know, he makes me more prepared. Bag work is all like more rounds in the bag work, more sparring rounds, more, um, you know, running, sprinting as strength and conditioning is one thing. Cause that's, he has us do strength and conditioning crazy. Um, and like I said, man, this, this training is really hardcore, you know, and Kevin really like pushes us um, to the limit. And I'm I feel very like, I sorry. I, I feel like that gym above many others for bare knuckle specifically is a great gym to be training at because there probably isn't too many gyms that are training bare knuckle. Now, obviously, you're not training and punching each other with bare knuckles and sparring yeah, yeah. battles, but it's a as we were talking with Luis Palomino earlier, it's a whole different science that a lot of people don't realize from the outside. A lot of people think, oh, this is boxing. Everything's the same. You're standing mm -hmm. up and punching each other. It's like, no, there's a lot more issues with th there's a there's different things that can happen, like hitting the hitting the top of the head with your hand and breaking your knuckles or, you know, that stuff like that. Yes, it can happen in MMA and boxing, but in bare knuckle, it, it happens faster and it can happen by simple things that you wouldn't have thought about punching somebody's elbow by accident. You know, it's there's a lot of different things in the clinch. You can fight in the clinch, you know, so training at a bare knuckle gym is definitely beneficial. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. And that's what uh, uh, Kevin has us do. You know, like he's been training me, like prepare for like the bare knuckle uh, conditioning, you know, like. I can I do the best I can to condition my hands. Yep. You know, um, learn the tactics. Um, like I said, like I said, um, I come from a boxing background, but I don't. I am not going to go in that fight and think I'm just gonna box. I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? I'm prepared to. I, I'm getting ready for the clinch work. I'm getting ready for the uh, you know, the dirty boxing. You know, I'm learning to do all that. You know, because I learn all that. And you know, again, I'm a young fighter. Um, and I'll, uh, I'm willing to learn as the sport grows, as I grow myself. And that's that's the only way from I myself as a fighter, you know, gets better. Well, dude, we're we're super excited to see you make your debut. Uh, we got to know you when we were down there in Miami. Uh, had a blast. New, yeah, you, we had a blast with you. You're a New, New England kid. You lit, You were literally where you were born. 
and then where you move to are are literally like one hour from where I live in either direction. Hartford's yeah. an hour that way. Worcester's an hour that way. Yeah, I used to party at Worcester all the time. We called it War Town. I don't know if they still call uh, it that. No, they still call it War Town. Five away. We call it Radio Five away. You know. Yeah, man. So. Shout out to you, and we're really looking forward to it. We got to ask you five questions real quick before we let you go. Uh, this is a speed round with Cito Navarro. Here we go. Number one, uh, why do you love chicken so much, Cito? <laughs> <laughs> What's up with you and chicken, bro? Oh, uh, man, I don't know. I love chicken. I guess my mom <laughs> made me this favorite, like, you know, chicken. I don't know. Because I'm ha I'm somewhat part Italian, so like she always puts Italian breadcrumbs on my chicken, and to the and to this day, like I don't know, I just love chicken. Yeah, man, like I don't know, I just love it, chicken. You know, like even at the weigh-ins, I'm gonna eat chicken. You know, the healthy chicken, but still, I just love chicken. All right, well, well number, <laughs> you know, number two, my, I was eating chicken. That's all I was eating. <laughs> I, yeah, we I know that's that's why we got a lot of questions here. Number number that's two, that's right. When eating wings, do you go for the flats or the drums? <laughs> And the drums. I like the drums better. You like the drums better? Okay. Your favorite chicken dish. <laughs> Damn. This is about food. Yo, you guys are messed up. Because, you know, I'm all... <laughs> and I'm trying to, like, eat healthy. <laughs> Chicken's healthy. Chicken's healthy. Nah, I don't know. Nah, but I'm thinking about Popeye's chicken and KFC <laughs> chicken. <laughs> all right. No, nah, I'm just kidding. But, Get uh, that devil off your shoulder. Uh, uh, I don't know, chicken lo mein. Chicken lo mein. He's there. You go. And I didn't see that one coming. I was I no? was thinking like chicken parm or something. And uh, what came? Go ahead, Mike. What came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> see? He's like, I don't fucking know. Nobody knows. That's good. No one knows. What came first? I don't know. The egg. Well, where did no. it come from? Yeah, I don't know. The See? answer is okay. dinosaurs, bro. The answer is dinosaurs. And our last question for you, it's not about chicken. Uh, how are you going to celebrate after you get this win in, in uh, BKSC New York? Um. Oh, wow. How am I going to celebrate? Um. So after I win, I mean, I'm going straight home. You know, I miss my mom. I miss my dad. I miss my family. You know, I miss everybody, my friends back home. And I haven't, I actually haven't seen my mom, my dad, like, last like last year like november december like you know i've been i sacrificed my life you know just to come down here you know and i've been doing this full time um since then so that's what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna celebrate uh you know back home enjoy back in war back in war town war town you know what i mean celebrate with my family and friends um eat chicken um and then after that you know <laughs> back to you know maybe back to florida again and then just get ready for the next fight there you go brother well it's awesome talking to you and it's really cool to finally get to see your uh debut coming up on no on uh march 12th you just said november yeah november stuck in my head march 12th seneca allegheny casino that is in salamanca new york if you guys live anywhere around there try to get to it it's uh it's a no great event yeah, no, no one lives there. I travel that bitch. It's a great venue. They put on a hell of a show there, and you're going to get to see a hell of an event with a debuting fight here. I'm just going to shout some blow, and then we'll go. Yeah, I was going to do that too. Man. Um, I want to shout out again. Kevin Smith. I make my dad happy and proud. You know, I, I can't wait to see him for um, for this fight. Um, you know what I mean? And like, yeah, man, I just, that's yeah. all I can say. Enjoy the moment, brother. Enjoy the moment. Go see him March 12th. Uh, get the app if you haven't gotten already and uh, tune in. Best of luck to you in your debut and uh, hope great things for you to come afterwards. Hey, I just want to say thank you guys for having me, uh, inviting me to this. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm very grateful for this. And uh, I hope I can put anyone that's watching right now, don't forget me. Um, you guys will know who my name is. And like, again, I'm not I'm, right now. No more talking for me. I'm going to just let my hands do the talking. All right. As we'll know who Lardy Navarro is on March 12th. That's all I got to say. There it is, bro. Yeah. I'll drink to that. You have a good one, man. Thank you very much for coming on. And best of luck, Mar March 12th. Good night. Later, man. All right. That's uh, all right, Cito all right. himself, Lardy Navarro. Uh, we got to spend an entire... 
day, pretty much an entire night and almost uh, some of the next day with him and his crew. Uh, very cool kid, uh, New England guy. Down super there nice my, guy. Always yeah. super nice and smiling, talking to everybody, taking pictures. I mean, he takes the yeah, moment he's, in. He's, he's really drinking it in. Um, but our last guest of the evening is in the weight room. She's been waiting patiently. She has been going to be fighting on the same day, March 12th, for the UFC fight night, Santos versus Ankalave. And she is taking a short notice fight. Here she is, Miranda Fear the Maverick. Hello. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? What's Good. up? Good. Tired. Tired and ready to go to bed after this. You're As you tired. can tell, I just got back from training. So sitting here yeah. talking to you guys right afterwards. Didn't well, get all fancied up. You know, Miranda, it, it seems like, remember the last time we talked to you, you don't ever really take breaks anyway. It's like you're either you're either uh, working out or training or in school or teaching, right? Pretty much it, exactly that. Luckily, I don't have classes anymore for school, but still finishing up my thesis and uh, working, uh, working still um, as I'm as I'm fighting full time. Oh, are you oh are you God. are you finishing school like all together? You graduating or are you uh, yeah, as soon done? as I get my thesis done, I will be graduated. Hallelujah! And yeah, um, I plan on never going to school again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hear you because I'm in school right now for the military, and I don't like school. That's what mm-hmm. I notice every time I come back to one of these. Mm-hmm. So uh, you are going to be fighting on short notice, relatively short notice. You got that fight on like three or four weeks notice? Or? Uh, no, two and a half. I got it last Friday, I think it was. Last two and a half. Oh, and you're fighting Sabina Mazo. Um, you guys are both coming off of a couple losses. One of your losses, I believe, was a, a very controversial uh decision against Macy Barber. I, I saw it going your way and I'm not just saying that cause you're on the show here, but either way, um, you're 24 years old. You're one of the fastest rising stars in the company. I'm sure you were jumping to the opportunity to get this fight when they, when they called you, right? Yes, I was. I actually had gotten a call from the UFC to take a different fight uh, about 12 hours before I got the fight to fight Sabina and it was against JJ Aldrich, who's one of my main training partners, which was amusing. Um, so <laughs> obviously said no to that, you know, had to clear up the air that she was my training partner and then uh, got the call about Sabina and there wasn't much hesitation other than making sure my coaches, <clears throat> my coaches could make it. And then I took the fight. I'm really excited about it. I've watched Sabina fight before. Um, and I've actually thought I was going to fight her in the past when she held the LFA title and I was trying to get, um, uh, trying to get that fight and she ended up getting pulled to the UFC a few weeks a few weeks prior to that. Now, who was she supposed to fight that you were stepping in on on a uh, short notice? Were you was she Mandy supposed to fight? Bohm. Mandy Bohm? Yeah, okay. And uh w- w- did she get injured? I don't know. I don't know the story. Uh, I don't know the story either. I think she got injured, but I I don't know any details. Yeah, so the the 125 division in the UFC is starting to get interesting, especially with the Ultimate Fighter coming up. They're starting to get a new crop of girls. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you see the division going? Do you see, like, um, after Sabina, right? Because, mm-hmm. honestly, when I look at the top 10 for, uh, for there, I see Valentina, and then I see a lot of people that are very similar in skill, and experience um do you realistically see like yourself you know a win or two from getting right back up into like the top 10 you know what i'm saying yeah, top 15 at least um i think some of the girls are better than others in the top 10 i think there's some that shouldn't be there but have gotten there just from purely matchups um and i'm kind of frustrated that they do keep thickening the pool of fighters you know in every division just because they're backed up as far as, you know, we're having to wait six months to fight. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of us fighters would love th- every three to four months, but there's just so many people that we all have to take turns. And now we do have a new crop of girls coming from uh, the tough, which um, actually one of them is my teammate, which I'm excited to see how she does. I think she's going to do very well, Claire Guthrie. Um, and I'm familiar with a lot of the girls in the tough. One or two of them I fought before. Um, so I'm excited to see see that new talent brought to the UFC. But after Sabina, I would assume I'm going to be close to the top 15 again, if not in it. And uh, the problem is, how do we not just keep replaying the same fights? You know, that's where you run into right. issues. 
because they keep fighting all these young girls right against the young girls again, just like I've whined about in the past. I'm I'm interested in, and you you named a few of them that are in the tough house right now. I'm interested in Helen Peralta coming out of there from she's uh, I think she's won three of three or three or four in a row for Invicta. She's also fought bare knuckle too. She's a very interesting fighter. Um, really interested in it. Now, does Sabina, does Sabina Mazo, um, anything about her? Like, do you have, do you see any, any like real threat there or is this something that, I how, think do, you, how do you feel about Sabina? There, I think every fight you have to assess that there's threats. If you don't see something as a threat, you're going to go in there underestimating them and end up finding problems. Um, I see Sabina as having pretty good striking. She's very long. I haven't fought too many long fighters. And unfortunately, almost every time I've ever gotten paired up in my pro career, it's been against grapplers, um, as people can see going back into my history. And so I'm excited to finally fight somebody who's known as a striker so that I can kind of show my well-roundedness both on the feet and on the ground, hopefully, in this fight. Yeah. In the switch to team elevation uh can you talk a little bit about that like have you have you looked at this as like a major step in your career or uh like not nothing against where you were training before but like you you've switched teams right since the last time we talked to you How's yeah that going? I, believe, I believe it has switched since the last time we talked basically i got out of where i was at as soon as i uh, got done with school classes and as soon as my husband was done with the military we moved like the day he was out and uh, decided to go wherever we wanted, basically. And that was based around my training um, and jobs and stuff of that nature that could fit around it. And for me, I thought that Easton and the whole Colorado Denver training system was one of the best places in the world. And so I came here to train. There's others out there, of course, like there's a couple in Florida I was looking at. There's one in, Can you know, there's Glory in Kansas City that I was thinking about that's closer to my family. Um, but here in Denver is where I ended up being. And so far, I just love the team. I love the coaches. It's a step up for me just because they have a cage. They're training MMA every day, not just jujitsu or Muay Thai. I have other females and males that are in the UFC that are that high level people that I can go against instead of just getting my confidence up going against amateurs or people that specialize in only one sport. Is Jillian Robertson in, mm -hmm. uh, in there? Is she on your, at your gym? No, she moves, she goes around a lot, like wherever Dean goes, she goes. Um, so she's came out here and trained a little okay. bit before, like for a couple of days at a time, um, but not full blown training here. She's actually the one filling in to fight JJ. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And you guys have fought each other in the past, right? Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. I know I saw the uh, Dean's been on the show too, a few times. He's like one of the funnest guys in the world. Did you get a chance to roll with him a little bit? I haven't rolled with him. He's only came and watched me and Jillian roll. I brought her out for my camp against Macy and I've seen her several times since. So he's watched and I've met him and he seems like a super great guy. Um, but I've never gotten to actually trained with him. He was just sitting on the sideline, eating like a honey bun, telling her what to do. Yeah, basically something like that. Yeah. <laughs> telling me what to do too. Telling me the stupid things I was doing. <laughs> eating some shitty gas station food while he's watching her like bust her ass on the ring, uh, on the, on the mats. That dude's hilarious, man. He he cracks me up every time we talk to him. Um, what did your what does your husband do in the military? Uh, he's out now, but uh, he was actually a contract specialist in the military, and now he's doing the same thing as a civilian. Pretty easy transition for him. Uh, he was in the Air Force, which uh, helps too. So just quick transition to the civilian. Probably get a government job in the future to where it's pretty stable and solidified. But oh, he also God. does like stocks and things like that on the side. We're trying to just level up our lives as we go. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, and you, you guys started, um, is, is fear the Maverick like an actual brand now? Do you, like you yes. have, you have all kinds of gear and yeah. Talk, actually, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I have my own website. I've had my own gear for a while now. I'm all the way from gloves to shirts and I'm actually getting ready to release a bunch of new ones within the next month. Um, I have hoodies that I literally released today that are on pre-order for people. I think the designs are pretty awesome personally, but I'm a little bit biased. I made them myself. Um, but yeah, people can pre-order that stuff or go online and order it um, at my website. And it really supports me. And I'm hoping to eventually have them just not my brand specific, but make them to where they're just designs that everyday people will like and use, especially for the gloves and things. Is it just, is it fearthemaverick.com? Is that what it is? It's fearthemaverick.net. 
dot net. Okay. If you look up dot com, I'm pretty sure it'll pop up too. <laughs> okay. And you des you said you design them all? Like you do all, or yeah, did you I make all the designs um and I send them and sometimes I can't digitalize them as good as I want. Um so other people will like put them into, you know, JPEG form or something like that. But I pretty much design all of them. Um I have gotten a couple artists that work for me and like made the logos. Um and one of them is Jenny. She's done an amazing job for me. I'll be tagging her in a lot of the a lot of the posts as I go along, but yeah. That's great. And uh, that's not like you were going to school for to be like a doctor, right? What, what were you going to school for? Yeah, I went to school to <laughs> industrial psychology, get my PhD in that. I'll have my master's in it is what I'll end up having now. Um, and I already work now based around that degree, um, not specifically, but it's related to it. And that's probably where I'm going to end up keeping my career for a while. I have a picture of uh, this is what you posted yeah, recently, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there it is in all its glory. Pick one up right now. There it is. There it is. That is pretty cool. Um, Someone better buy one right now, damn that's it. That's right. They better go. It's on my Instagram shop. It's on my Facebook. I just got done sharing it like a few hours ago. That's awesome. Um, so you are going to continue to work full time and fight in the UFC? Is that the plan? I don't work full time. I work part time. But yes, oh. I plan on doing both the entire time. Um, I have a very flexible schedule and my training always comes first. My boss is super, super nice about that. Like next week, I won't be working any hours and it's not like I'm taking vacation time. I get right. paid by the hour. That's so awesome. I just say, hey, I'm off next week. And he'll be like, OK, let's work around the next, you know, while and make sure we add on hours here, take away hours there and um, we make it work. And it's been amazing. I work as a statistician right now, uh, contracted to Hershey. So I'm excited to be there and plan on staying there for a while. It really blows my mind that people uh, like yourself can pull so many things off. <laughs> I don't Just think like... people around me like it too much, you know, Some people are a little I'm a pretty busy person. I don't get to go out and have fun all the time or uh, spend as much time with my husband as I wish I could. But in a few years, that's the goal, you know, make it to where our future has a lot more time to where I'm free and more successful to where all this time will be worth it hustling. I feel like that's practical, though, because a lot of people don't think about the long game. They just think about now. And, you know, you do more now than you have more to do later instead of bagging at, uh, you know, stop and shop when you're 75 years old. I always feel bad when I see people. I'm like, oh, my God, like, I don't want who wants to work when they're in their 70s. Nobody. Get exactly. that done now. Yeah, I don't want to be done with fighting and be like, all right, I'm retired. Time to go work a minimum wage job. You know, like I don't I would like to at least start somewhere. And right now I'm to where I could have a, a way above average job if I quit fighting if I needed to. And what a lot of fighters don't realize until they've had a big scare is it can all be over like that. Not just getting cut. I'm not talking about that, but like an injury in training or anything else could just take you out of the sport forever. It's such an easy such a high risk sport. Yeah, you're uh, extremely intelligent for you. I mean, like you, uh, you have a a work ethic and a drive that most 24 year olds that I know don't have. And I can tell you that most 24 year olds that we have in the military absolutely don't have that drive. Yeah, yeah that was yeah that that was a shot at all you young soldiers that I have underneath me. You know who I'm talking to fix yourselves. That's funny. I'll give my dad credit for that one. A lot of people think he was in the military the way he raised us kids, but uh, he wasn't, but believed in corporal punishment still. And uh, <laughs> we worked really hard as kids. And I think that work ethic followed into my future years. And he kind of just taught us, you know, the importance of end goals. And I think living day to day. And as people say, like, live every moment like you'll never have it again. I don't really believe in that. I don't believe in doing the whole live one day at a time. I think you should plan for the future. And then every step that you take towards that gets you to that goal. Yeah. Anybody that saw the uh, after the cage documentary, there was a good, good portion. Of it. I was probably like 20 minute portion on you alone. And it showed you and your dad, and and I think you have you have a sister, right? You guys yeah, I have were, a sister and a brother, you, my dad. And my you guys mom. were always you beating each, each other up in the living room, <laughs> yeah. and your dad had you yeah, working. Yeah, the coolest video actually, um, if you haven't seen it yet, is Anatomy of the Fighter. Um, he did a episode on me, and he did a fantastic job. Um, the after the cage one was great too. I think that the Anatomy of a Fighter 
did better at my day to day life rather than just in general. And is I think, that on YouTube? Uh, yeah, it'll be on YouTube. Um, I'm sure other places too, but YouTube for sure. Just anatomy of a fighter, Miranda Maverick. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Jay says she won the fight against Macy big time, but got screwed over by the judges. Yeah. We talked about that earlier, Jay. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you should only be coming off uh, a single L right now on your record, and you're looking to get back in that winning column on March 12th against Sabina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are excited to see you fight, but we wanted to do a little something with you tonight. It's called uh, Because You Are Fear the Maverick. We're going to play a little game called uh, Fear the Most with Fear the Maverick. Okay. Okay. We're just going to throw a couple things at you, and which one are you more afraid of? <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Number number one. Spiders or snakes? Snakes. Yeah, you don't. You're not. A, you're not. I, I I am scared of spiders too, but at least I can <laughs> squish them real quick. You know, at least I can be like whack. You're gone. To where uh, snakes are a little bit harder to kill, and sometimes they'll kill you. You know, spiders. Like even if you get a bad spider bite, usually they got medicine. You could go to the vet and get medicine for it real quick, but snakes at least in the area that we're in not i don't like those so much i've had water moccasins around me before and those yeah. things will hunt you they don't just like you know warn you that they're there they're like oh yeah, you're gonna get near me i'm gonna eat you you said something there that I, I hope my wife is watching and she's taking note miranda said i'm afraid of spiders too but at least i could just kill them real quick my <laughs> wife will take a fucking like clear tupperware and like put it on top of it and put a book on top of it and then take a picture <laughs> lift it and up. then she'll, yeah she'll take a picture with her phone of a of a clear bowl on top of a spider with a book on it and she'll be like you need to kill that when you get home that's ridiculous i will tell pete to come kill the spider but it's more because it's funny and usually he's worse at it than me <laughs> oh, that shit is hilarious I'll number tell you two what's worse than spiders and snakes snakes on planes you got to watch out for those oh, <laughs> snakes on planes <laughs> My Ghosts or aliens? <sighs> Which one is it? What do I fear most? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ghosts or aliens. Probably ghosts. Probably because nobody's ever seen an alien yet. Well, that and I, I'm a uh, faith-driven person, and I think that ghosts can be related <laughs> to spirits, and I believe in those entirely, and I think there can be evil spirits out there that can really uh, affect your whole life. I mean, we've all seen the exorcism of Emily Rose, man. Yeah. That shit is real, son. <laughs> I don't know if it's real. <laughs> All right, number three: large crowds or confined spaces. A hundred percent confined spaces. I hate it, especially if it's dark. I'm not a person to put in a confined space. I don't like it at all. My dad was um, after he he was a corrections officer. He was in the Department of Corrections for twenty years. He retired, and then he, after about a couple of years of retirement and like working a little odd jobs here and there. He got a job x-raying metal for um, submarines. And he was telling me about some of like the the small spots that you got to like crawl in. Yeah, no. Like <laughs> he's like, you're in a tube like this big. I'm like, nah, hell no. See, large oh crowds, you can just like push people out of the way. They always say make elbow room, right? <laughs> Get out of the way, move. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, confined space 100%. Mike, you agree? Yeah, I'm I'm all set with that. You ever see the 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 documentary about um the the soccer team, I think it was, that got stuck inside of the cave and then the water what? went like no. raised and the whole team got stuck inside the cave so they had to send divers in and oh, like where they yes. had to go was such a tiny little tunnel so like divers like went in and got them and had to uh, hook up the oxygen tanks to the kids and they actually had to knock them out. So they like put them to sleep to bring them out of there what? so that they didn't panic when they were going to, it's the craziest story. It's like an entire, they went in there and there was no water and then the water filled up and a whole soccer team was, was stuck. And it was in another country. I, I, well, guess, I wish I could remember the name of it. I'll have to look into that one. That's crazy. That's the scariest thing I've ever seen. Like I can't, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to be going through any kind of tunnel into anywhere where there's water. No way. <laughs> no way. Number four, meeting new people or trying new food. I'm not worried about either one of those. Um, I always say I will 
so there's some new food I don't like or I don't like the look of, but I've always said I will try everything one time. Mm. And I love meeting people. I think that's how you learn a lot of things, how you learn new cultures. And now you might run into some people you don't like, but I'm not scared of either one of those, really. I would have spit out I, the food, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I would have a much harder time with the food than people for sure i'm we've been watching the amazing race I and mean, that's like our thing that we do on wednesday nights with our kids we watch the amazing race and they had to go to this place in like corsica and they had to eat this delicacy cheese that has living maggots in the cheese uh see I'm like, why uh, would they do they that? Would. Like, why is that a delicacy in that country? Why do they Why do they eat that? Yeah, it would be food for me if I was forced to do it, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know. It's like the food thing is crazy. All right, heights or the dark? Ooh, that one's hard. I don't like either one of those things, but probably heights. Yeah, I... Yeah, especially because I, I don't know too many places that are so dark or that you don't have something on you that could be a light, you know, or even the night stars, <laughs> but heights, I'm a, I'm a big chicken. Like I remember my dad has been like, just stand up and walk and we'll be like on the roof walking along two by fours. And it's like, if you fall, you know, you've got all this stuff to grab a hold of. And I'm like, no, I feel like I'd just die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the way, like I was thinking about it, like, Cause I ask these questions to my wife when I, when I prepare for this show and I'm like, Hey, what would you, what would you be more scared of heights or the dark? She's like, I don't know. How high is it? I'm like, okay, you're on a drawbridge across the Canyon or standing in the dark at a, in yeah, a, uh, in a cemetery. The worst that can happen. The dark's <laughs> never going to hurt you. Heights can hurt you. Like... Everyone knows monsters are not real. Come on. <laughs> but ghosts might be. There you go. Mike, next one. Oh, clowns or dolls. Clowns for sure. Clowns for clowns sure. Clowns for sure because they're actually living beings, you know? Like some clowns are really creepy. Just, Absolutely. I don't Any, like it. Anybody that wants to see uh, the craziest clown movie ever, look up The Terrifier on Amazon and you'll oh, thank God. me later. Oh, geez. I will yeah. say when I was a kid, I didn't mind clowns. It's just the whole society's perspective on clowns that has made me not like them. When I was a kid, I remember there was the little guy that made the bubble animals, you know? Yeah. And I was like, can I have one of those? It was really exciting. I liked it. But he wasn't like full blown dressed up as a clown. And now they have all these movies with all the perverts and stuff as oh, clowns man. and trying to eat you and stuff. I'm like, no, no more clowns. You know, fun fact about me that you might not know that I have told this story on the on this show before, but I have a tattoo of Pennywise the clown on my shoulder from it. A big okay. one. It's big. Okay. And he's like reaching out like this. And I told my wife, I'm going to get a new tattoo today. And she's like, what are you getting? This is before we were married, by the way. Okay, I okay. said, I'm going to get Pennywise the Clown from it. She was like, no, you're not. If you get that, we can't stay together. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, then I won't get it. And I went and I got it anyway. And she's still with me. She married me. So. Oh, well, I don't know. Why'd you get it? I need to know the why. I just think that I, I was really in, in like into the original it. I was I loved it as a kid and I thought that it was like the greatest horror villain of all time at the time. And I just thought it was a super cool evil clown to put on my shoulder. So oh my. <laughs> I don't know. There's no other reason besides that. And fun fact about that, I got it done in my friend Frank's kitchen. Uh Frankie tattooed me in his kitchen. While I drank a 12 pack of uh Bush, I mean, a uh, Bud Light and a like a fifth of Jägermeister while he was smoking weed the entire time he was tattooing my shoulder, came out great, by the way. Oh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the important part. <laughs> yeah. It's just see these wild stories. Number seven, skydiving, sky diving or scuba diving, scuba. Oh, yeah, scuba diving. Yeah, because there's dinosaurs in the ocean. Oh, there's just more to be worried about, I feel like. <sighs> Skydiving, I feel like you have a little bit more control. I mean, I don't know that. I've never done either one. I don't plan on it ever. But scuba diving, I have, like, terrors. Like, we were just talking about claustrophobia and stuff. I'm like, what happens if I get stuck? What happens if the oxygen runs out? Like, we aren't even good enough swimmers with the oxygen that we could probably make it back up if, like, yeah. a flipper fell off or something. I'm so glad you said this. 
I, yeah. I am not into it at all. My 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 father in law is like, you guys should get your scuba diving license. Come with scuba diving. We'll go down to Florida and go. I'm like, oh, like no, that's man. pretty. I will say the ocean has beautiful places, right? But but the little sharks running around in each one of those beautiful places, just uh, little tiger sharks and the beautiful reefs. No, right. Place. There's too much. There's too much on. There's too much undiscovered stuff in the ocean for well, me. Well, the stuff that is discovered, half of it's deadly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, here we go. We got a couple more. Tequila or whiskey? Neither. I don't really drink, and I can't stand either of those. <laughs> there you go. So they both terrify you. Number uh, nine. I don't like the space. taste of alcohol. It's just gross. I don't. I don't know. If you can't taste it, then I'm all right. Well, I got Bro, some good stuff right here that I'm drinking. It's like a Irish. It's like a single brew Irish cream. Okay. Single batch. Okay. Straight from Ireland. <laughs> it's sounds, delicious. I swear to God. Very foo foo, Mike. Um, <laughs> it is. It's wonderful and, too. Yeah, you said if you can't taste it, this should be fine. Well, tequila and whiskey, you're tasting those, and they're ruining your night. Number nine. Space of the ocean. I think I know the answer. <laughs> hmm. Uh, it just depends on the situation I'm in. I don't know. Probably space. I mean, yeah, for sure space. I'll get an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Over that, if they're like, okay, you can go fly in a rocket ship to space or you can go scuba diving. I guess I'd pick scuba diving. I love it. You wouldn't spend um, $800,000 or whatever it costs, those idiots that went to space for nine minutes and barely <laughs> left Earth. No, I have zero interest of leaving the ground. If I didn't have to fly to fights, I wouldn't fly. <laughs> really? Do you have a fear of, uh, of flying? I just don't like things I'm not in control of. I think that's about it. Outstanding. And our last one for you, failure or death? <sighs> well, uh, that's, a, hard that's, a, I would, that's a thinker. I'd say failure. So based on my religious views, death isn't all that bad, right? If you live like you're supposed to live. So I guess I'd be more afraid of failure. And I do see failure as one of the worst things I can have happen. It feels pretty sucky when I fail at stuff. But you can look at it from the perspective of every time you fail, you learn stuff. I get mm -hmm. that. But at the same time, you should be able to do that when you do stuff right as well. There you go. That was fear the most with fear the maverick, Miranda Maverick fighting. Good idea. Good idea. Whoever came up with yeah, that. Yeah, that was that was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, that guy up there is a senior leader course for the army right now. It's ruining his days, <laughs> and I'm up here <laughs> holding down the fort. But yeah. uh, you have a fight, March twelfth. We're excited. We can't wait to see you back in there. What can we expect in this fight, Miranda? How how are you approaching this fight? Fast. I on, you know, I always say I'm going to try to get a finish, but I really am going in there this time, I'm trying to kind of redeem myself, show that I belong in there, and show that I'm well-rounded. And that's the end goal. There it is. That's the end goal, and it's a pretty good card that you're you're on there. You got some um, some big boys in the main event. Uh, it should be a good night. Um. Why don't you uh, shout some things out and um, tell people how to follow you and we'll let you get out of here. Perfect. I see you guys have attached you on the bottom too. You're awesome. But uh, go check out the website, fearthemaverick.net. Check out Instagram, Facebook. It's all at Fear the Maverick. Pretty simple, pretty easy to check out. Um, TikTok I have too. I don't really use it too much, but <laughs> but it's there. So you can check me out there too. Everybody's um, got to have a TikTok now. Everybody right? has to. Has to. You <laughs> want to make money, you get a TikTok, I guess. That's how it works. And uh, yeah, I've got new merchandise coming out and things. If you want to support me, please go pre-order that stuff and it'll help me a lot. Um, other than that, watch my fight March 12th. Check out the sponsors that I have. They're on my website and on my Instagram. Um, I'm really excited. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Anything? The documentary is called The Rescue. Look it up. Okay. About okay. that team. It's awesome. I'll check it out. You guys go look up Anatomy of the Fighter, too. I, I will definitely oh, absolutely do that. will. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. You're always welcome back. And best of luck on, uh, on uh, March 12th. Thank you. I appreciate it. See you later. Bye. Bye. Miranda Maverick, 125 pounder who is on a two fight losing streak, but she absolutely won the fight against Macy Barber in my eyes. I have, uh, you know, went back and checked it out a couple times and 
I believe Macy got the fucking uh, the favoritism discount there in that one. You you know as soon as you like get off an interview and then you immediately you start thinking of questions that you like were thinking of asking and didn't ask. I was wondering if after that fight that Dana White did Dana White things because we know how he is and he's pretty outspoken. I feel like did he come right up to her and go, wait, wait, "You wait, fucking won that you fight. You won that fight. So we're just gonna count this as a win <laughs> in the back on the unofficial." Official, yeah, on, the unofficial on official the white, record on his, make on his whiteboard. Yeah, yeah, on That's his whiteboard really in the war room. In the war room, you won that fight. Yeah, when like you <laughs> go on Wikipedia, she has a loss. When you go in the war room on the whiteboard, you see that she's got a win in that column. So that's all that really matters, right? Yeah, if that's Dana all. White's got it up as a win. Yeah, that's right. what matters. That's a good. good. Ryan Chaddock says, "Uh, um, Caddick. I, I said Chaddock. That like he has a has an H in his fucking name. Stunad. Uh, what do you guys think about? Um, the sixth judge, like, uh, like jury panel of judges. It could work. I I don't see how you can have an even number of judges. Honestly, I, I don't know yeah, how that would work. Correct. Right. I don't. I don't. I don't agree sense. with an even number of judges unless he had a really good explanation on how six judges can work. It was three groups oh. of two. It, oh, it's kind. Oh, so it's no. I don't like that. I'd. I think I don't, I don't like know. the groups, but I think if there was five or seven, it would probably work a little bit better because you get more people, uh, and I would hope that you wouldn't get as many stu nods to judge a fight at one time. <laughs> but as we've seen before, sometimes you have three stu nods, so I don't even understand it. What I think is get better judges, get judges that were fighters. Get judges that are not old people that don't know what they're looking at, you know, or uninformed and uneducated about the sport. That's what we need. We need people who know what they're doing, not boxing judges who come over to watch MMA and aren't fans of MMA, you know, not boxing judges judging bare knuckle or MMA. I'm sure they can cross over, but we need educated judges. That's what I think needs to happen educated yeah. and we need to start holding people there needs to be a system to hold them accountable if everyone thinks you fucked up you may be like your license you get like a ding and you get so many dings you don't judge for six months you lose the ability to judge and if you come back and do it again you lose for a year and then after that you're fired you're done you're not judging again they, they need some kind of a system where they can have like you know, maybe someone vote, they vote, they come up with a thing and they say, you know, did you, know, you see the that, judge um, goes to like court or something? You know what I'm saying? Did you see that verdict is a official partner with Invicta now and verdict is going to show that the fantastic. Vic verdict after every round is going to show the worldwide score. I, I, for, I love for, it. listen, for anybody who doesn't know what verdict is, if you're an MMA fan, Get on your phone, go to the go to the app store and download Verdict. It is fucking awesome. It is like the best it's the best website that has ever come out when it comes to like getting an idea of what the public is what it, it's almost instantaneous. Like as soon as a round ends, take your phone, put your vote in, who won that fight? 10 set 10 8 10 9 10 7 whatever you think it is. Put it in, and within seconds, verdict compiles the world, and it'll have like forty nine point three to forty whatever. It's pretty spot on. It's yeah, it it's unbelievably awesome. And whoever came up with that system is fucking great. And yes, the open scoring system. What Ryan's saying there, open scoring system. I believe. Invicta is going to have some sort of open scoring system with, with verdict. It's going to be fucking awesome. Yeah. I don't know. Jessica Link says, I'm salty about the BKFC judging, but it's all been bad all around lately. I agree. That's what we we're just talking about. Like the ju there's a problem with judging across sure the is. board in all combat sports. And like Mike said, when you have 
uh, three boxing judges from Mississippi that never watched a bare knuckle fight in their fucking life or an MMA fight ever. And they're supposed to give an educated, um, they're, they're supposed to judge with an educated eye on something they know nothing about. What the fuck? When Get you some retired fight, fighters. You, you got a whole a bunch of retired fighters in the audience at every fucking right. You know I mean? Just right. Get them. Right. I mean, they. so when you have a fight, right, and you're watching it and you're at home and you're like, that was, you know, 49, 46. Uh, you know, everyone thinks so. And then you get to the card and they start reading it off and they're like, judge, so, you know, so-and-so has it. And it's completely opposite. And you're like, like, how is that person getting away with doing that? It's like watching the weatherman call a fight. I just don't understand it. You can't be wrong every fucking fight. You need to have consequences, you know? Jeez. Right. And you get those, like, you get those few fights where it's like everybody in the world saw it the same way. And they'll be like, judge so-and-so had it 48-47. For so and so, Judge blah 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 had it forty eight forty seven. So for so and so, yeah, Judge blah 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 had it fifty forty five for the other guy. Wait, like, what? What? <laughs> what the hell? Fucking! What are you watching? Oh man, yeah, it drives me wait, nuts. And I'm in wait, my house wait, wait, yelling wait, and shit wait, at one o'clock like, in the morning. Is, yeah, did that guy like fuck up and think that he was judging for the other guy the whole time? That's what I think sometimes. You know what I mean? It's just wild. It's fucking wildly out of control and uh, they need to do, do better. But anyways, man, shout out to our guests for the evening. Um, Luis Palomino, nothing but respect for that guy. He's a class act. Yeah. He, he presents himself so fucking well and everywhere at the, at the press conference, the media days, the, everywhere in the ring outside the ring on these interviews he's a he's a stand-up guy he's a great fighter six and oh now and we'll we'll see what he does with that belt and uh judges need to get the, get the same hate that the rest yes exactly the refs get put on the fucking chopping block if they screw up just by a, a millisecond if they're off you know no, i i they love that i love that comment right there absolutely the judges should get freaking lambasted for some of the bullshit that they do i i love going back to my my number one robbery robbery job of all time in in my eyes is is the one i've said it a million times and i'll never back off this stance valentina shevchenko beat amanda nunez in their second fight i will say it a million times out of a million the judges that night should have been fucking you should have gave him one of these mike right one of these wow. should have tied him to the rims and gave him heat stroke. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> anyways, Luis Palomino, nothing but good things to say about him. I can't wait to see what they do with him next. He has options. He has Alvin Brito. He has, I mean, he has Chad Mendez. He's got Mike Richmond. Mike Richmond. There's, there's guys that are interested and want to fight him. Um, Cito, great kid. We met him down in Miami. Great great kid down there and uh he's been tr he's been working his nuts off at uh smith brothers down there with kevin and right now and jay and those guys um new england kid best of luck to him um and last but not least miranda maverick she came back on the show tonight she took a short notice fight two weeks from now um actually it's what nine days from now yeah Nine yeah. days out. She's nine days out from making a return to the UFC uh, cage. So you guys got a lot of fighting to watch on March 12th. But this weekend, before we leave, let's wrap it up here. This weekend, you got the grudge match of all grudge matches. Jorge Masvidal versus Kobe Covington. I saw this on, uh, if you guys are into gambling, which some of us are, um, if you do not have FanDuel, and you sign up for FanDuel right now. FanDuel will give you a plus 3,000 on either one of the main event fighters. Literally, it's a win-win. You bet, and you can only bet $5, but you could bet five to win $150 back. It's fucking crazy. And it doesn't matter who you pick. So, but anyways, my pick's Colby Covington in that fight. Mike, what do you got? 
Uh, that's what I have too. Jorge Masvidal, he's got the power. But at this point, I just think that he is going to be smothered by Colby. I think Colby's going to smother him, break him down. Uh, he Colby's faster too. So I, I just think that th- Masvidal's good at getting up. You know, he's a guy who can keep fighting and getting back to his feet and stuff. But I think if he's smothered, he's going to just, it, it's going to be similar to Usman, but not quite Usman because Usman's very, very powerful. You know, he's very strong. But I see that Robbie Lawler type of a fight with Colby Covington where he's going to try to just keep taking him down, beating him up a bit, smothering him, and that's probably going to be most of the fight. I hope they just fucking blast each other the whole fight. That's what I hope. (laughs) What what amazes me about Jorge Masvidal is that, and I am not trashing him one bit, but he has been around for fucking ever. He's mm-hmm. won a lot of fights. He's lost a lot of fights. He just signed a new contract with the UFC today, making him one of the top five highest paid fighters in the company. He's coming off two losses in a row, two losses that he did not win a single round in either one of those fights, right? Lost every round of the first fight against Camaro. Granted, it was on six days notice. Shout out to fucking Jorge for doing that one. But then he got a full camp and he fought Jorge, he fought Camaro a second time and got beat up the whole time there. So he's coming off two losses in a row and he's about to fight Kobe Covington, who is the closest thing to Kamaru Usman out there. He could very well lose three fights in a row and just got a brand new contract to make him one of the top five fight, uh, highest paid fighters in the sport. It's something about that guy. I don't know. It's just his like, marketability. I don't, I don't know how he's doing it, but he's fucking doing it. He's the most marketable guy out there right now. It's yep. crazy. It's crazy, man. It's a uh, it's a wild fucking world we're living in. But you got Rafael dos Anjos fighting um, Moicano now. Edson Barbosa and Bryce Mitchell. It's a Kevin Holland versus Alex uh, Cowboy Oliveira. Jalen Turner's back in there. Marina Rodriguez is back in there. There's a, there's some really good fights on this card here. So I'm looking forward to it this weekend. With that said, Mike, we're gonna do a show next Wednesday, and um, we'll see we'll see everybody there. I'm not sure exactly who our guests are, but we will have some guests for you next weekend. And with that said, Mike, I think uh, you need to get some sleep because you got to get some school done in the morning. Hey, eh? eh? hold up, hold up, hold up. What are you doing tomorrow? Huh? What time you got to go to school? I'm getting up at like six o'clock. You know, I'm gonna do the damn thing. I'm gonna get some breakfast, and I gotta go talk about Operation Anaconda. You know what I'm saying? All right, man. Well, have fun <laughs> at school tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. Peace. <laughs>